Every once in a while, a stellar cataclysm occurs in our universe, bringing the life of a star to an end. The most common type of cataclysm is a core collapse supernova, where a massive star's interior implodes, leading to a runaway fusion reaction and a tremendous explosion, where the energy emitted by the star can briefly shine billions of times brighter than a typical star. And yet, it's the rarer types of stellar cataclysms, superluminous supernovae, hypernovae, tidal disruptions events, and even more exotic explosions that can shine brighter than anything else we have observed. One star glowing as brightly as a billion, well, it's something called a supernova explosion. It's a, the death of a massive star. Notably, such a spectacle of a lifetime is coming closer than ever. You must have guessed it. We're talking about the star Betelgeuse, which someday soon may offer up the greatest fireworks display the human race has ever seen. Located a mere 642 light years away, Betelgeuse is a bright red pulsating point of light in the constellation Orion. A member of a class of titanic stars known as red supergiants, Betelgeuse is one of the largest stars we know of, with a girth that is truly mind-blowing. If we were to swap it out for the Sun, its outer edge would consume the inner planets, including Earth, and reach beyond the orbit of Mars. In recent years, astronomers noticed that Betelgeuse had begun acting oddly. In a matter of days, it had it visibly and drastically dimmed by some 60%, an episode dubbed the Great Dimming Event. At the same time, its shape had changed from a sphere to something resembling a deflated football. However, just in recent weeks, the star has at Tim's shown more than 50%, brighter than normal, drawing renewed attention from the whole world. The sudden fluctuations led researchers to believe that Betelgeuse may have entered a stellar death spiral and that a massive explosion known as a supernova was imminent. The situation is so intense that even the physicist Brian Cox also has broken his silence to warn us about a blast so bright it would outshine even the moon in our night sky. If we take the lines away, the most interesting star, I think, the, the star that could be shocking in our sky is this one, Betelgeuse or Betelgeuse. It's a red giant star. If you put it where the sun is, it would extend out to the orbit of Jupiter. It's enormous. It's very unstable. It's about to explode. Join us as we dig deep into how Betelgeuse will explosively end its life in a supernova. Right now, Betelgeuse is absolutely enormous, irregularly shaped, and with an uneven surface temperature. It's more than 2,000 degrees C cooler than our sun, but also much larger, at approximately 900 times our sun's radius and occupying some 700,000 thousand times our sun's volume. If you were to replace our sun with Betelgeuse, it would engulf Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, the asteroid belt, and even Jupiter. But there are also enormous extended emissions around Betelgeuse from material that's been blown off over the past few dozen millennia, matter and gas that extends out farther than Neptune's orbit around our sun. Over time, as the inevitable supernova approaches, Betelgeuse will shed more mass, continue to expand, dim, and brighten chaotically, and will burn progressively heavier elements in its core. Even when it transitions from carbon to neon to oxygen to silicon fusion, we won't have any directly observable signatures of those events. The rate of the core's fusion and energy output will change but our understanding of how that affects the star's photosphere and chromosphere, the parts that we can observe, is too poor for us to extract concrete predictions about. The energy spectrum of the neutrinos produced in the core, the one observable we know will change, is irrelevant as the neutrino flux is far too low to be detectable from hundreds of light years away. But at some critical moment in the star's evolutionary process, the inner core's silicon burning will reach completion, and the radiation pressure deep inside Betelgeuse will plummet. As this pressure was the only thing holding the star up against gravitational collapse, the inner core, composed of elements like iron, cobalt, and nickel, 
now begins to implode. It's difficult to imagine the scale of this, an object totaling about 20 solar masses spread out over the volume of Jupiter's orbit whose inner core is comparable to, and more massive than, the size of the Sun suddenly begins to rapidly collapse. As large as the gravitational force was pulling everything in on itself, it was counterbalanced by the radiation pressure coming from nuclear fusion in the interior. Now, that fusion, and that outward pressure, is suddenly gone, and collapse proceeds uninhibited. The innermost atomic nuclei, a dense collection of iron, nickel, cobalt, and other similar elements, get forcefully scrunched together, where they fuse into an enormous ball of neutrons. The layers atop them also collapse, but rebound against the dense proto-neutron star in the core, which triggers an incredible burst of nuclear fusion. As the layers pile up, they rebound, creating waves of fusion, radiation, and pressure that cascade through the star. These fusion reactions take place over a timescale of approximately 10 seconds, and the overwhelming majority of the energy is carried away in the form of neutrinos, which hardly ever interact with matter. The remaining energy-carrying particles, including neutrons, nuclei, electrons, and photons, even with the intense amounts of energy imparted to them, have to have their energy cascade and propagate through the entire outer layers of the star. As a result of this, the neutrinos become the first signals to escape and the first signal to arrive on Earth. With the energies that supernovae impart to these particles, on the order of around 10 to 50 mega electron volts per quantum of energy, the neutrinos will move at speeds indistinguishable from the speed of light. Whenever the supernova actually occurs, or occurred, which could have been any time from the 14th century onward. It will be the neutrinos that arrive here on Earth first, some 640 years later. In 1987, a supernova from 168,000 light years away wound up creating a signal of a little over 20 neutrinos across three small neutrino detectors that were operating at the time. There are many different neutrino observatories in operation today, much larger and more sensitive than the ones we had at our disposal 33 years ago, and Betelgeuse, just 640 light-years away only, would send a signal some 70,000 times stronger on Earth due to its close proximity. In 2024, if Betelgeuse were to go supernova, our first surefire signature would come in the form of high-energy neutrinos flooding our neutrino detectors all over the world in a burst spanning some 10 to 15 seconds. There would literally be millions, perhaps even tens of millions of neutrinos picked up all at once by these observatories. A few hours later, when the first energetic ripples created by this cataclysm reached the star's outer layers, a breakout of photons would reach us a swift spike that increased Betelgeuse's optical brightness tremendously. All of a sudden, the luminosity of Betelgeuse would spike by about a factor of $7,000 from its previously steady value. It would go from one of the brightest stars in the night sky to the brightness of a thin crescent moon, about 40 times brighter than the planet Venus. That peak brightness would only last for a few minutes before falling again back to being just about five times brighter than it previously was. But then, the traditional supernova rise begins. Over a time period of approximately 10 days, the brightness of Betelgeuse will gradually rise, eventually becoming about as bright as the full moon. Its brightness will surpass all the stars and planets after about an hour, will reach that of a half moon in three days, and will reach its maximum brightness after approximately 10 days. To sky watchers across the globe, Betelgeuse will appear to be even brighter than the full moon, as instead of being spread out over half a degree like the full moon, all of its brightness will be concentrated into a single, solitary, saturated point. As a type 2 supernova, Betelgeuse will remain bright for a very long time, Although there are large variations within these classes of supernovae for exactly how bright they become and how bright they remain over long periods of time. The supernova, after reaching maximum brightness, will slowly begin to fade over the time span of about a month, becoming about as dim as a half moon after 30 days time. 
Over the next two months, however, its brightness will plateau, becoming dimmer only to instruments and astrophotographers. The typical human eye will not be able to discern a change in brightness over this time. All of a sudden, though, the brightness will drop precipitously over the next fourth month since detonation. It will go back to barely being brighter than Venus by the end of that time. And finally, over the next year or two, it will gradually fade out of existence, with the supernova remnant visible only through telescopes. At peak brightness, Betelgeuse will shine approximately as brightly as 10 billion suns, all packed together. By the time a couple of years have gone by, it will be too faint to be seen with the naked human eye. The reason the supernova remains so bright for the first three months or so isn't even from the explosion itself, but rather from a combination of radioactive decays, from cobalt, for example, and the expanding gases in the supernova remnant. During those first three months or so, Betelgeuse will be so bright that it will be clearly visible during the day as well as the night. Only after the fourth month or so will it become a nighttime-only object. And as it begins to fade from its brightness to look like a normal star once again, the extended structures should remain illuminated through a telescope for decades, centuries, and even millennia to come. It will become the closest supernova remnant in recorded history and will remain a spectacular sight and astronomical object of study for generations to come. Whenever Betelgeuse finally does go supernova, and it could be tonight, next decade, or 100,000 years from now, it will become the most witnessed astronomical event in human history, visible to nearly all of Earth's inhabitants. The first signal to arrive won't be visual at all, but will come in the form of neutrinos, a typically elusive particle that will flood our terrestrial detectors by the millions. After that, a few hours later, the light will first arrive in a spike, followed by a gradual brightening over a little more than a week, which will fall off in stages over the coming months before gradually declining for years. The remnant, which consists of gaseous outer layers illuminated for thousands of years, will continue to delight our descendants for generations to come. We have no idea when the show will begin, but at least we know what to look for and expect when it actually occurs. At that time, hope that our time machine, the James Webb Space Telescope, can capture some breathtaking images of stunning scenes that only happen once in a lifetime. The arrival of the cutting-edge James Webb Space Telescope has revealed the structure of the iconic supernovas in greater detail than ever before. For instance, just a few weeks ago, James Webb spotted the remains of a supernova explosion in a new light. The remnants, called Cassiopeia A, or Cass A for short, lie 11,000 light years from Earth in the constellation Cassiopeia. In April of this year, Webb imaged the stellar remains in mid infrared light. Now, the newly released snapshot shows Cass A's colorful, orb like wisps captured using James Webb's NIR cam. The light from Cassiopeia A's explosion reached Earth about 340 years ago. Scientists estimate that in its early days, the star that yielded the explosion had a mass 16 times that of the Sun, but it shrank to about five times the size of the Sun before it blew. Since the explosion occurred thousands of light years from Earth, it took thousands of years for its light to reach us. Previously, the Hubble Space Telescope, Spitzer Space Telescope, Chandra X-ray Observatory and other telescopes had imaged Cass A. Chandra's study revealed the amounts of different elements produced by the explosion. The supernova has spat out 10,000 house times the mass of the Earth in sulfur, 20,000 times Earth's mass in silicon, 70,000 Earth masses of iron and a million Earth masses of oxygen. Webb's NIR cam detects wavelengths of light that are broader than visible light and thus can't be seen by the human eye. So, to compose the new image, researchers translated the infrared light in different colors. The bright orange and light pink areas in the new image represent the supernova's inner shell and are made up of sulfur, oxygen, argon, and neon from the star. Dust and molecules that will one day form new stars are in this gas, 
As that dust cools, it glows. This light echo, nicknamed Baby Cass A, is about 170 light years behind the main supernova remnant. Beside James Webb, a new search for supernova remnants in our galaxy is underway. Scientists are with aiming to find hundreds of these star explosion remains scattered across the Milky Way by using radio observations captured with the Very Large Array in New Mexico and the Meerkat Array of radio telescopes in South Africa. A supernova, as told, is a destructive stellar explosion, either of a massive star at the end of its life or a white dwarf that has accumulated too much stolen matter on its surface, taken from a companion star and undergoes a thermonuclear explosion. Either way, the star or white dwarf is blown to smithereens, its guts strewn across space to form a supernova remnant. This debris contains many heavy elements formed in the violence of the supernova explosion, and at the leading edge of these remnants are shock waves that initially move at perhaps 10% of the speed of light. Long after the light of the supernova has faded, this expanding remnant of gas and dust lingers for hundreds of thousands of years, gradually slowing its expansion as it disperses into the interstellar medium. Between 300 and 400 supernova remnants have so far been found in our Milky Way galaxy. Some of these are sure things, including the Crab Nebula, the Veil Nebula, the Vela supernova remnant, and the Cassiopeia A supernova remnant, which is about 330 years old. The youngest known supernova remnant in our galaxy is G1.9 plus 0.3 which is found in the Milky Way's inner portion and is about 130 years old. However, observations of other galaxies find that these other realms are home to many more supernova remnants than are known in our galaxy. And based on the number of remnants in those nearby galaxies, astronomers reckon there should be as many as 1,000 in our galaxy, meaning there are likely many still to be discovered. Now, West Virginia University professor of astronomy Loren Anderson is on a hunt for those yet-to-be-found star explosion remains. There is a severe discrepancy in the number of supernova remnants we would expect to see compared to the relatively low number we have detected, said Anderson in a statement. With a grant of $331,170 from the National Science Foundation, Anderson and West Virginia University graduate student Timothy Ferber will use the Very Large Array and Meerkat to search for radio emissions stemming from hidden supernova remnants. They plan to employ machine learning as well as the visual inspection of digital sky images to try and distinguish them from other forms of nebulosity in the galaxy, such as star-forming H2 regions of molecular hydrogen. In particular, Anderson and Ferber will direct their search towards the galactic center where the high density of stars increases the chances of finding recent supernova remnants. Plus, they aim to not only find new remnants, but also to confirm whether objects suspected of being remnants indeed are, and to rule out any H2 regions that have been misidentified as supernova remnants. According to Anderson, this study is timely. Recent data from Meerkat allow for the most sensitive search for supernova remnants yet and recent works have identified hundreds of possible supernova remnants that need to be confirmed. Finding the remnants isn't just an exercise in cataloging them. They are all important to study. For example, the shape of a remnant and the distribution of its elements can allow astronomers to create 3D simulations depicting how a supernova ejects its debris, how that debris interacts with the interstellar medium, and ultimately, how the debris ends up in gas clouds that form the next generation of stars and planets. In another remarkable finding, scientists just stated that we may be closer than ever to cracking the mystery of what lies deep beneath the surface of dead, ultra-dense stars called neutron stars. A new supercomputer analysis of neutron stars has revealed that there's between an 80% and 90% chance that these bodies have cores packed with free quarks which are fundamental, subatomic particles usually only found bound together in other particles, like protons and neutrons. 
protons and neutrons themselves come together to form the nuclei of atoms, around which electrons reside. But according to the team, if neutron star cores are indeed full of free quarks, they'd be composed of an exotic form of matter known as cold quark matter. And in cold quark matter, individual protons and neutrons cannot exist. So, atoms cannot exist, only the quarks. If true, this would make neutron stars akin to incredibly enormous atomic nuclei. As research lead author Junas Natala, who is about to take over as associate professor at the University of Helsinki, said in a statement, it is fascinating to concretely see how each new neutron star observation enables us to deduce the properties of neutron star matter with increasing precision. Neutron stars are born when stars with masses between 10 and 20 times that of the Sun run out of the fuel necessary for intrinsic nuclear fusion occurring in their cores. This results in the cessation of the outward energy that for millions or even billions of years has held the star stable against the inward pressure of its own gravity. With gravity the victor in this cosmic tug of war, a star's core begins to collapse. As this happens, the outer material of the star, where nuclear fusion is still taking place, gets blown away in a massive supernova explosion. This leaves the stellar core with a mass between one and two times, that of the Sun condensed down to a width of only around 12 miles, 20 kilometers. This massive reduction in the size of what is now a neutron star creates matter that is so dense a mere sugar cube-sized block of it would weigh around 1 billion tons if brought to Earth. That's a sugar cube that weighs as much as 3,000 Empire State Buildings. So now the question is, what is this incredibly exotic matter, probably found nowhere else in the universe, made of? And, more generally, can the conditions at the densest regions of these dead stars really create an entirely new phase of matter called cold quark, matter void of protons and neutrons? Scientists can't visit neutron stars to get a sample of this material. Even the closest neutron stars are around 400 light years away. So the next best thing is to simulate the conditions beneath the star's surfaces using a powerful combination of actual astronomical data and supercomputers. This new research used a type of statistical deduction called Bayesian inference that calculates the likelihood of different model parameters by making direct comparisons with observational data. This allowed the team to determine the boundaries for neutron star matter, leading the crew to conclude the presence of cold quark matter to a high degree of probability. The mechanism also suggested a state of matter exists in neutron stars that is non-nuclear, in which quarks are allowed to exist, deconfined in protons, neutrons, and other particles. Their constituent quarks and gluons are instead liberated from their typical color confinement and are allowed to move almost freely," said Alexei Voronin, a professor of theoretical physics at the University of Helsinki. The team's supercomputer simulations also suggest a below 20% probability that matter within neutron stars experiences a rapid state change from nuclear matter to quark matter, almost like water changing to ice. Such a quick change in matter could destabilize neutron stars in a way that could make even a tiny quark matter collapse to birth a black hole. The research also offered that the existence of quark matter cores could be fully confirmed in the future with some further analysis. The key to this would be to determine the strength of the phase transition from nuclear matter to quark matter something that could be possible when gravitational wave detectors become sensitive enough to hear. Tiny ripplies in space at time stemming from the last moment before two neutron stars orbiting one another collide. Nonetheless, even with improved observational data, better models of neutron star cores will still require a vast amount of computational power and time. As Yunus Hirvonen team member and a graduate student at the University of Helsinki said in the statement, We had to use millions of CPU hours of supercomputer time to be able to compare our theoretical predictions to observations 
and to constrain the likelihood of quark matter cores. That's all the information that we have for you today. And don't forget to give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed today's episode, subscribe if you haven't already, and hit the bell so you never miss out on future episodes. And be sure to also tell us what you think about today's content. Everyone's support motivates us to continue delivering quality content and to always improve. As always, thanks for watching, and we will see you next time.